please welcome Bishop Tudor Bismarck. Can you show some love to your pastor, your apostle, Pastor Jimmy? Amen, his lovely sister, God bless you. Greetings, everybody. God bless all of you, all of you watching online. It's certainly an honor and a privilege to be in one of my favorite places in the whole world, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I know Chichi is watching, but Chichi and I have always said, one day when we retire, we want to live in Lagos. I love the crazy, I love the traffic, I love... I, I love it all, I, I just... And sometimes we'll get on a three-wheeler motorcycle and go and eat street food. Hotel food is junk, but I love street food, amen. And certainly an honor for us to be here with uh, friends we've known for decades, Tommy and Brenda Todd. We love them so much, so much. And the iconic Michael Todd and his lovely honey, God bless you. <laughs> Lifelong friends and colleagues, the Mileses, uh, who are so kind and loving. <laughs> many faces we see whose names we, we can't attach to your face, but many names that we recognize, but I, I can't put a face to your name. You're so welcome this evening, amen. I'm gonna preach to you for about 50 minutes after I read my scripture and uh, Um, who, who preached last night? Francis Miles? Why, why did they do that to me? I thought you loved me. You put me behind Miles. All right. Let's go to Romans 5, verse number 1. Psalm 16. Verse 7, Psalm 8, verse 5 to 6. And we will rehearse those as we get to the respective scriptures. I'm going to be with you as soon as I'm done with my scriptures for 50 minutes. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Everyone say the glory of God. The glory of God. May the glory of God. Say the glory of God. The glory of God. Colossians 1, 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you the hope of glory? Say the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Psalm 16, verse number 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel my reins also instruct me in the right in the night seasons 
So in the night seasons, you need your rains. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. He shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. My last scripture with many more to come. Psalm 8 verse 5. Verse 1 says, What is man that you are mindful of him? Verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Verse number five. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have, and you made him above to have dominion over the works of his hand. You have put all things under his feet. For 50 minutes, clock starts now. Hope of glory. Turn to three people, say, hope of glory. And then tell them you love them, you may be seated. In the faculty or discipline of philosophy, there are several pillars on which we construct our fundamental core beliefs and values. The first one, of course, and these are based on Socrates, Aristotle, Archimedes, and various significant uh, philosophical giants of the Greek golden age. Politics is the first one, and politics is simply the rule of the people. As far as politics is concerned, it deals with the affairs of a city a state or a nation and uh, is set occasionally around activities and decisions by groups of people. And the challenge with Greek uh, politics in its uh, respective versions and conversions one out of a hundred, if 51 people agree to a thing, that is the majority, 49% who have an opinion are not considered the majority and yet they too, by a point or two, have the power of their own will. And it becomes very difficult to mediate between varying opinions. Nevertheless, our world in general is governed by democracy. Africa's democracy, that's another animal. We won't get into that. <laughs> and then we have ethics. Ethics is also the morality of philosophy. It is the discipline concerned with good, bad, moral, right, and wrong. The term also is applied to a system of theory, conceptual, hyperbole, hypothesis of moral values and principles. So in 
our world, including Nigeria, Zimbabwe, we lean more towards a Western type of morality where it would be immoral for a 60-year-old man to marry and become sexually active with a 12-year-old girl. A girl has to at least be 18 and above to make her own decision with little to no coercion by parents to have the privilege of falling in love with its respective versions, eros, etc., uh, etc., et all of those versions of love to love the person she is going to marry. And so when we're dealing with ethics, uh, the Greeks put it in a very broad sense. Number three, stay with the brother. Aesthetics. Aesthetics then is a branch of philosophy that is concerned with nature and its appreciation for art and its beauty. And so I take notes on everything. I, I wanted to know why there were so many speakers here. So obviously we have power singers uh, whom I didn't get to hear. Power preachers, I, I noticed so many instruments there. So I know there's a sense of Jurassic Park in the corner. <laughs> I'm extremely envious of your massive screen. So I've told Tammy to try to sneak it in my overhead luggage when I leave. <laughs> and it's not fair that you have such a good looking pastor and sister. And I'm so glad I'm preaching in front of Michael. I'm gonna make it hard for you. <laughs> and so aesthetics then has to do with beauty, the way you look, the way you make a building look. I'm intrigued as to why you use this color carpet and not green or blue or opaque or whatever the case might be. There are obviously reasons for it. Why do you have so many cameras? There are obviously reasons you have chosen. You could have had 20 instead of six, uh, and there are reasons for it. I make notes on everything. And so when you're dealing with aesthetics, it comes from the word, Greek word, aesthetonitis, which derives from the meaning a sense of perfection. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And so everything that God has created that has its name is at the highest level of excellence. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have to demonstrate excellence. <laughs> say you have to demonstrate excellence. And so because we have a large church and I'm constantly headhunting for quality leaders, I only spend maybe three or four minutes, if that, with individuals, and I judge them by two things, three things really. If their shoes are not polished, I don't trust them. Because <laughs> if a man or a woman can't take two minutes to polish their shoes, they won't polish my ministry. I don't trust them if they don't brush their teeth. Because if a person can't smile with good ivories, they are not worthy to be the face of our ministry. And I judge them, maybe unreasonably so, by the way they smell. Because generally, a person's odor reveals their personal lifestyle which will then affect and infect our ministry. And so that to, has to do with aesthetics. And then there's logic, logic. In 
philosophy, logic is the study of the laws of thought. And I think what Africa needs, sisters and brothers, are not just more churches, and God alone knows we have too many churches. Some shouldn't be in existence because a lot of guys that have started churches is because they can't find a job. And they are using people for income. Uh, again, that's just me. Don't quote anybody. That's just me. And this year, on the 18th of, 18th of August, I will be celebrating 50 years of ministry. And in 50 years, in 50 years, you learn about two things in life, just two. You learn about two things in life. And one of them is that trust and trusting people is very difficult and rare. And so there are a lot of people who don't exercise logic, which is a discipline of thought. Many people react as opposed to respond. So when you have something come towards a leader, what makes you a leader is the way you respond to a challenge as opposed to react, lash out, or injure an individual. And so logic then is a correct manner of reasoning, a valid uh, pathological way of formulating truth, a science of investigative ability where one investigates before they draw a conclusion of an issue or an incident. And so it is important then that when we investigate an incident or a challenge or a problem, that we approach it in a neutral manner, an independent manner, thus coming to a logical conclusion, not a supposition, but literally an objective that can assist the individual who may through naivety or may through immaturity have made the wrong decision. We have injured too many young people who have made young people's mistakes because they lack experience, lack knowledge, and lack mentors. And so after being in years for so many ministry, for so many years, I am learning. Turn to your neighbor and say he's learning. <laughs> I am learning how to be patient with younger men and women. If you are 35 years and under, turn to somebody with a white beard and say, be patient with me. <laughs> All the women who have gray streaks, turn to a woman who has colored her hair and say, be patient with me. And then there is the, in philosophy, stay with me, I take a long time to start, I'll get there. There is epistemology, which is the same as etymology, which is the origination or the original thought or concept of the formation of a word and its application. So when you read the book of Genesis and then further Exodus, you have to look at the epistemological structure of what God was trying to communicate through Moses to people that were enslaved for 430 years. 
So in chapter number one of Genesis, Moses did not have the time or uh, the, the space to explain in depth, in detail, the scientific, technological, philosophical uh, premise of all of creation. And so he says in verse 3, let there be light. He doesn't explain it travels at 186,000 miles per second in straight lines, can only be bent by a prism, and in so doing create seven colors of the rainbow. He doesn't take the time to explain that. He then adds that to a handbook or some sort of a transcript where students studying the Torah, Hef Torah, Mishnah, and other religious books that can explain a statement as let there be light and its varying classifications from the candle of the Lord being a soul in your spirit to the light of his son, which is the center of our solar system, to God who is light. I believe you're tracking with me. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. All right. If somebody's sleeping, just slap them on the head. <laughs> and so the great Greek philosophers who followed the Babylonians, who were the head of gold, the Medes and the Persians, who were ruled by law, and of course, it is Tuesday, right? It is Tuesday. So, so Tuesday, these are die-hard people that want to be in church. You want to be in church so you know your Bible. Saturday and Sunday is just people who have nothing to do because Liverpool is not playing, so they'll come to church. So you'll understand my train of thought. And so the philosophers evolved from Socrates to Aristotle and various others began to explain the philosophical ideas in which thought as a whole is constructed. And so Jesus finds himself at the beginning of a Roman era in 54 BC. Julius Caesar was killed in the Senate on the 9th of March called the Ides of March by individuals who felt he wielded too much power and had moved as head of a consul, which were three, to becoming an emperor, which was one. And they killed him brutally and developed a Senate, a rule of government on behalf of the people. And whenever you have government that rules on behalf of the people, when we vote for said leaders, they make broad assumptions on what the people want as opposed to what they take. I won't get into Nigerian corruption. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. And so when people take what they want instead of what the people need, they create a sense of their glory. They become glorious by the size of their house, by the cars they drive, the clothes they wear, the many women that are consorts. And we become as Justin Trueblood said, we become thingified. Our Heavenly Father, 10, I was 6, 31 of Matthew. Our Heavenly Father knows we need these things. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. But he says in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first 
the kingdom of and all these things will be added unto you. So God is not intimidated by your desire for things. What God wants you to do is to create an inventory, a priority of who and what comes first. It's God first, righteousness second, things third. You can have a house like that song uh, in If I Were a Rich Man. Ya da 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 He said, I'd build a house with staircases that lead to nowhere. If I were a rich man. And so God doesn't mind you being rich, provided God first, righteousness second, things third. Say that. That was all the women. What happened to the brothers? <laughs> Let's say that again. <laughs> Correct. And so in our quest to gain things, God first, righteousness, and things, we then come to the agency of this message, which is glory. And so Ephesians 1 verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened or awakened or being opened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So it's God's glory in the inheritance of the saints. Shout to God be the glory. One of the greatest songs ever written was written in the 70s by the late great Andre Crouch, which is an eternal anthem to God be the glory for the things he has done. How can I say thanks for all the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you did it all to prove your love to me. The voices of a thousand angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and all that I hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory for things he has done. For anything you have ever done, accomplished, achieved, hoped to do, God must get the glory. Shout to God be the glory. Shout it three more times. Colossians, we might just have church tonight. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, that is Christ in you the hope of glory. So it was hidden from Adam, Cain, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons, onto the judges, Hannah, Ruth, yada, yada. All of that was hidden from them, is that Christ in us, the hope of glory, not glory, the hope of it. There's a difference between glory and the hope of it. Faith is the substance of things. You guys are so boring. Faith is the substance of things. So I am tired. I left Harari at half past two this morning and got here 
at about half past one, sat in your amazing immigration office. They are so efficient. <laughs> for an hour and a half, for them to approve a visa that was already approved. And I was hoping to be here on time. And so my hope has been fulfilled. Give the man from Zimbabwe a hand for hope fulfilled. Amen. Colossians chapter number, 1 Peter 1, 21. Whom by, who by him do believe in God that raised up Jesus from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And so Jesus could only attain glory after his crucifixion. So glory then has got to be earned. Glory is just not conferred on an individual. And so in studying some of this lesson, I watched all kinds of programs. I watched The 100 Meters by the disqualified Ben Johnson, uh, Hussein Bolt, Carl Lewis, different fights. And it's very difficult to remember outside of uh, George Foreman who lost and came second because most times all the glory is placed on the person who is a winner and comes first. And so shout three times, I am a winner. And because you are a winner, you are entitled to glory. With Christ in you, the hope of glory defers or changes from being the hope of glory to living as a person with glory. Stay with me. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. So in other words, the first Adam had glory. He lost his glory in disobedience to God. When Jesus came, he restored the agency of glory. So when the curtain was ripped from top to bottom, the glory on the priests was taken away from them and placed 40 days later on men sitting in an upper room. What was behind the veil came and sat on men and women 120. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven that sat on each of them. And they were all filled with what we see in Genesis 1 and verse 2. The earth was empty, dark, and void and filled with chaos, which is the story of mankind. But the Spirit of God moved on the earth, and the first thing that came was light. And the people in Jerusalem, filled with confusion, empty and void, in Acts 1, 37, said to Peter, who preached a magnificent homily, saying, this Christ whom you crucified is the savior of the world. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gave them the answer because the Holy Spirit began to restore 
the glory of man. Turn to somebody and say, you have your own glory. Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Stay with me. And so we as human beings, we have been clothed with glory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7, but the ministration of death written and engraved in stones, that's the law, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was done away. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, how much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? But we all with open face beholding in a glass, my goodness, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord. The glass is the word mirror. Beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when you give your heart to the Lord, which I did, 52 years ago, in 1972, 15 years old, didn't even know how to sin properly, just a little boy, gave my heart to the Lord. When I came out of the water in baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I looked in the mirror, I did not see Tudor Bismarck as I was. I saw the image of Jesus Christ in the mirror. I moved from the glory of man to the glory of God. Shout, I have glory. glory. Come on, shout, I have glory. glory. Stay with me right now. And so I want to deal now with psychology and its journey because psychology and its journey helps us to understand why human beings around the world are struggling and finding it difficult, including Christians, in terms of self-discovery. And so in the late 19th century, Sigmund Freud came up with an idea that when a person came to him and said, I am sick, even though they could not identify any biological or physiological pain, he discovered that pain is pain and that some of that pain was attributed to a mental ailment. And he came up with an idea of psychology or psychiatric treatment. And he developed an idea which is called simply the will to pleasure. And he said, if you can give a human being pleasure, you will accommodate their need. But pleasure uncontrolled and pleasure outside of boundaries is destructive because a human being who gives themselves to pleasure doesn't know where to stop. So when God said one woman for one man, he knows exactly what he's talking about. Bob Molly added and said, no woman, no cry. <laughs> it's, it's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> and so the point that God was making that the more you add pleasure to your life without boundaries, you are bound for self-destruction. So you give a young boy expensive toys, he's going to burn up. You give a young woman, a young boy, expensive things, they will not appreciate the value of what it took to get that expensive thing. If you give your children a massive house, fully furnished, with everything they could ever want, and haven't spent a day in earning anything, they become a spoiled brat 
and somebody that you can't school, teach, mentor, correct. And so pleasure then must be accompanied with strict discipline. So if you want this, you have to do this to earn it. Oh, what a boring congregation. <laughs> and as the years went by, a different philosopher who developed out of challenges from the First World War, please stay with me, it's going to get better. Uh, a philosopher in the 19th century, Frederick N Nish, said, if you will give a human being power called the will to power, if you give a human being power, you will resolve all of the issues. Because pleasure on its own cannot satisfy a human being. Unconstrained, it will self-destruct in a human being. But if you give a human being power, that human being will be able to, with power, design a life and design a future with the kinds of boundaries that can get them to their destiny or destination. The problem with human beings, human beings can't handle power. For example, you can take a simple man off a street in Ikeja and make him a security guard at this office. Put him at the gate with a uniform as a security guard. From the street, eating out of dirt bins to becoming a security guard at this church. The minute somebody drives up in a very elaborate, expensive Mercedes Benz, the security guard puts power in his head and says, no park here. <laughs> park there. And you can say, I am the chairman of the board. I don't care. I say, park there. Because a human being, ask Hitler, ask Mussolini, ask Napoleon, go back and ask all the greats in history that were given power, including philosophers like Voltaire, including great artists and musicians like Rembrandt uh, and Van Gogh, and the list goes on of Disraeli, Kwame Nkrumah, Robert Mugabe. Give all human beings power without boundaries. They abuse power and abuse the people and entities they have power over. And so when the Lord says, go to Jerusalem and you receive power from on high, that power is directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only agency that can help direct power. All power belongs to God. And as long as you become a leader in the body of Christ, in whatever capacity, as a husband, a wife, a grandfather, grandmother, a child, school teacher, business owner, pastor, apostle, prophet, archbishop, chief, 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 archbishop, whatever you want to call yourself, the minute you don't understand power, you will abuse people. And you will abuse their well-earned, hard earnings. Shout, Lord, give me power but establish boundaries. Shout that again. This pulpit is a sacred desk. We use this to dispense a word that we believe God has given us. But this pulpit should never be used to manipulate control and use manipulation, intimidation, and domination over God's people. God gave us power over every living thing in the earth. Genesis 1 verse 3, 
to the middle of Genesis 1, verse 26. But in the middle of verse 26, when he made man in his image and after his likeness, he never gave another human being power over another human being. That's why Nimrod was judged. That's why Pharaoh was judged. That's why Nebuchadnezzar was judged. That's why Herod, all of them were judged because they took dominion over another human being. We share dominion together. We take authority together. But you are not my slave. You might work for me and you might abide by the laws of my organization, but I don't have the right to make you my slave. Can I preach like I'm feeling it now? Shall I have dominion? What is man that thou art mindful of him? You gave him power over all of creation, but not one time did you give him power over another human being. Should God bless me and give me a large organization from a church to a factory to an export company with thousands of workers, I have dominion in the environment because of the quality of my product, but I don't have dominion over an employee. They must be subject to the laws of HR. If they violate human resources, they lose their job. But I don't have power to buy a person to do my will because we have dominion together, not over one another. So Pharaoh, you have taken dominion over God's people for 430 years. You have got to go and you're gonna pay for it with your firstborn son. Shall I have dominion? Shall I have dominion? But not over another human being. I have dominion over sin. I have dominion over devils. I have dominion over curses. I have dominion over the works of the flesh. I have dominion over worldly systems, but I don't have dominion over another person. We are equal. And if two of you shall agree on anything as touching anything on heaven and earth, it shall be done. Turn to a neighbor and say, I need you. Shall I need you? I might be an apostle and I am, but I need a prophet and an evangelist because we need each other. Ephesians 4, 11, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Five, for the edifying of the saints and the perfecting of the church. If you have two hands, clap them seven times. Come on, clap them six times. In the second, in the second world war, a primatologist and an, ester, uh, an epistemologist by the name of Viktor Frankl, a Jewish thinker, was arrested in 1942 as an Austrian physician put into four concentration camps led by the evil man Adolf Hitler who wrote in 1925 a book called Mein Kampf by translation, My Struggle. And in that book, he spelled out 
pluralism, the superior race of Aryanism, the German Caucasian people that excluded Jewish people. And in his journey to rise up into power, there was so much objection from the Jewish, from the German nationalists to be paying reparations and war expenses from the war they caused from 1913 to the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. And when Hitler rose to power, the central part of his message was the Germans are superior over all the people of the world. And through that pluralism, and through that dogma, he declared war on the whole world. And anybody who makes themselves a boss over another person, to dominate another person, and abuse another person and put them into concentration camps and kill at least six million of them and, and uh, abuse and hurt another group of millions can't survive because when God is in it, God won't tolerate it. God hates racism. He hates apartheid. He hates genderism. God hates sexism. Any ism that you find, God is against it because he made man in his image and after his likeness, male and female created he them. I need about a thousand women to clap your hands. And so when Moses was born, the third of three children, Miriam is the first. She's the courtyard. Aaron is the second. He's the holy place. Moses is the holiest of holies. They saw he was a proper child. That's why he was the only one that could go into the mountain and talk with God face to face. And so Moses, who was trained in all the wisdom of Egypt and was mighty in word and deed, Acts 7.22, had to be banished from Egypt because until you kill the world in you, until you destroy the Egypt in you, you won't discover the purpose and glory of God for you. And so he was banished to Midian, the head of state in Midian. And Midian Jethro taught Moses how to be a head of state, taught him how to come in and how to go out taught him how to manage his temperament, his temper, his flesh, his emotions, his inconsistencies, his psychological challenges. And after 40 years of being in Midian's school, had a doctorate in psychological constraint and approached Pharaoh and was able to handle all kinds of pressure, turn to a person and say, you can't succeed if you can't handle pressure. I want you to say it with passion. If 
If you can't handle pressure, you'll never see glory. If you can't handle pressure, you'll never rise to the top. If you can't handle pressure, forget about leadership. If you can't handle pressure, you'll be a pauper all your life. If you can't handle pressure, you'll never be trusted with big money. If you can't handle pressure, forget about a big church. If you can't handle pressure, don't run for politics. Tell your neighbor, you gotta big up yourself. You gotta be strong in the Lord. You've gotta have power and might. You've gotta face Goliath, knowing that it's life or death. Clap your hands 12 times. I'm nearly there. I've gone two minutes over my time. Can I take five more minutes? Can I take five more minutes? I'm nearly there. And so there are levels of glory. Shout, there are levels of glory. You gotta push me now, Tammy. There are levels of glory. In chapter number, in chapter number four, and chapter number four of Luke and, and Matthew, the devil took Jesus into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and showed him the glory of them and said, all this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. The fact that someone or something has built an entity that has glory to display. You don't have to bow down and worship that glory because if it took that entity and that individual and that spiritual being to build that glory and he's offering it to you, it simply means he knows that you have the capacity to build the same kind of glory and even more so a greater glory shout glory is surrounding my life tell a neighbor to God be the glory but he's also given me my glory I'm closing now Sisters and brothers, Moses had his glory. Come on, Tammy, you gotta push now. Moses had his glory. The Bible says of Moses that when he came into the tabernacle, the glory of God came on Moses, but Moses' face was shining because in God's presence, your glory comes out. The Bible says of Laban, in Genesis 31 verse one, the words of the sons of Laban said to Jacob, you have taken our father's glory. Laban became so wealthy that in his neighborhood, People adored him because of his riches. He developed his glory. Joseph, when he revealed himself to his brothers, said to them, is daddy still alive? Go and tell him I'm alive and tell him of my glory. Genesis 45, verse 3 to 12. Joseph went into a well. He went into part of his house, went into prison, but eventually he was raised up to number three in the kingdom and received his glory. 
I came to Lagos to tell a thousand people and 10,000 people online, get ready for your glory. You're coming out of the ditch. You're coming out of prison. You're coming out of obscurity. You're coming out of lies. You're coming out of self self accusation. You coming out of self hate and God's giving you your glory. I say to God be the glory, but God gives his glory to the sons of men. Slap three people a high five. Say get ready for glory in your life. Job said in Job 19 verse 8, he has fenced up my way. They cannot pass into my darkness. He has stripped me of my glory, which means I had glory. Shout, my glory will not be stripped. Shout, my glory will not be stripped. Shout, my glory will not be stripped. Job 29, verse 18. Then I said, I shall not die in my nest. I shall multiply my days. My root was spread out by waters. Dew by night upon my branches and my glory was fresh on me. I've been through hell. I've been through trial. I lost my houses. I lost my animals. I lost my goats, sheep, and camels. I even lost my children. But a day is coming when my glory shall be fresh on me. Give yourself a high five. Say fresh glory. Fresh, fresh glory. Give yourself another high five. Say fresh glory is coming on me. I was nothing. I had nothing. I was nowhere. But fresh glory is coming on my life. The glory of the ladder house shall be greater. The glory of the ladder house shall be greater. Shall be greater than the glory of the former house. A thousand men clap your hands and shout. I got to close now. I got to close now. Shout, I have glory. Shout, I have glory. Bible says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Jesus is in your life, there's the hope of glory. I might not be in my glory yet, but every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. The steps of a good man are honored by the Lord. I am one step towards my glory where I am right now. I'm hoping for glory. Now abide of faith, hope, and love. So I have faith, 
my next step is hope so I'm taking the step towards glory that's why the devil is fighting me the devil fought Jesus and crucified him on a Friday if the devil knew that Jesus was going to rise in glory he would never have crucified him so the trial you are going through is a crucifixion for your glory to manifest in your life I said there's glory coming in my life shout glory is coming in my life it's Christ in me the hope of glory so I say rise Jesus rise rise in my life rise Jesus rise in my mind rise Jesus rise in my spirit rise Jesus rise in my family rise Jesus rise in my business rise Jesus rise in my career rise Jesus rise in this conference show your glory show your glory show your glory if they kill you if they kill you like Stephen the last thing they will see is the glory of God in your life they may persecute you hate you talk about you even kill you but your glory will never die it will never die shout three times I have glory in my life I have glory I have glory in my life I cannot fail I will not fail glory is in my life yeah 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 I said yeah Still doing it, still doing it.